So I talked about this about a month ago as well, or elements of this anyway. So the future of directional drilling. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of folks running around saying that the end is near. You know, the sky is falling. Uh, you know, the apocalypse is upon us. You're seeing directional drillers walking around impersonating zombies. But uh, is that in fact true? Now there's, I will say that I don't think it's going to be like it has been in the past. I think we have changed uh, with no prospects of going back. So remember we said, are we pointed in the right direction? This just came out this morning in uh, fuel fix within the Chronicle. The industry is looking at a $300 billion write down because the, va the value of shale assets has decreased this much. Now, while this is primarily a uh, paper loss, eventually paper losses have a way of, of uh, leaking into your bottom line. So our industry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if I'd go quite so far as to say, are we in a crisis or is this an aberration? I've been in the industry for 40 years. I've seen lots of ups and downs, but this one is pretty sudden and it's been really deep. So is this going to fundamentally shift how we do it? So how does this tie in then to what we're talking about in terms of drilling for production? Well, the problem with the write downs here is because you cannot predict conclusively the type of production you're going to get from a given well. Joe showed you the distribution on the curves. I am not an actuary, but I always felt that uh, one of the best classes I took in college was statistics because it showed to me that you can make the numbers mean anything you want. A good statistician can sway what you think. And I think the industry for years had been projecting what kind of return was gonna come from a given type of well. And they were wrong, consistently wrong. And about three or four years ago, the financial industry started calling them on. And then all of a sudden the investment capital started drying up. You couldn't just keep drilling at a frenetic pace. You know, what, what's the classic definition of insanity? That you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. I'm kind of paraphrasing uh, the conversation I had with Troy a little earlier, right? But we keep trying to do the same things and hope we get a different result. So where does that actually leave us? If you look at this, this is a slide that was put together by a Braxton Miner at Concho. And this shows the average US rig count, the average Permian Basin rig count, average oil prices, and average directional day rate. So you see the range from roughly $5,500 a day to $13,000 a day. You see when activity got good, the prices for directional services went up. And those were the good days. Those were the heydays, right? 2012, 2013, right up until the end of 2014 uh, when the bottom dropped out. And you'll see the prices going back and forth uh, through that time frame. a little bit of an uptick in 18, uh, but the price is coming down and especially now. So today, well, actually, as of two days ago, the rig count was 266 in the United States. It was 147 rigs drilling in the Permian Basin. And if you look at the numbers here, the four month average into the early part of 2020 was 343. So you see we're at less than half the number of rigs in the Permian. So what does that have to do with drilling towards production? Well, we currently are missing the mark as an industry. Our 
commercial models are fatally flawed because we're faster drilling means that there's fewer billable days. When you're on a day rate contract, what day, a rig that used to take 45 days now takes 15 or less. Same well, but obviously that is at best a third of the revenue. There's fewer rigs going on. A lot of it's been market driven because of the uh, the decrease in demand and we're drilling faster. I've been told by several operators, one operator in particular, at the beginning of this year, they were drilling a wolf camp well in 18 days in January. It's now down to 10. I mean, that is almost fraud. Uh, it could be, <laughs> or they never bothered to get into it to begin with, right? Yeah, yeah. The the question Ron had was, uh, does that mean that they were out of zone? I can't answer that question. I'm not sure they knew where the zone was exactly, but uh, but you see what I'm saying. I'm just looking at this from a mathematics standpoint, and uh, we're talking about the commerciality of this automation is becoming more and more of a thing. Fewer personnel. When you automate, you don't need quite as many people. That's one of the drives for automation. So bigger, faster, more powerful equipment. There's a couple of guys in the room here can attest to that. You know, five and a half inch motors and six and a half inch borehole, right? These things are beasts. Advanced bit designs, cutters, uh, rotary steerables are much more robust. I mean, we're just drilling faster and faster and faster. But yet, you're getting lower prices. So you see what I'm saying? This is a pinch point. And then at the end of the day, this goes with Ron's question. Are we in the most productive zone when we're drilling, or are we drilling even faster losers? The problem is, is today that many operators are drilling the wells and they're not even completing them right now. So you don't even know if you've drilled a better well or not, except for the fact that you're drilling it much faster. So we literally could be drilling ourselves out of business. I mean, as an industry, not just the directional drilling industry, because we're not putting that out. And there's this, uh, this little rule that I found, things that can't go on forever don't. That means it's unsustainable. And I would submit to you that as an industry, what we're doing right now is unsustainable. It just cannot keep going on. Impact on field personnel, rig counts going down, real-time operating centers. Okay, so now we got 2DDs are watching three rigs or four rigs now instead of one. Automation, do we need the same number of people? Result of that is that the day rate has greater. I'm hearing day rates for directional drillers right now between $300 and $350 a day. That's a third of what it was a year ago. So it's having a significant impact on our industry. I just threw a couple of these little tidbits in because directional drillers are still directional drillers. Right? So we have a rapidly evolving industry. We're doing more with less. I would suggest to you that the U.S. can maintain production in the unconventionables with less than 500 rigs today. You think about the numbers I'm telling you in terms of days versus depth, how fast we're drilling these wells, that even with the steep declines in the unconventionals, we don't need a thousand rigs anymore just to maintain our plateau production, which is roughly around 12.8 to 13 million barrels a day. At that rate, the U.S. is the swing producer in the world. Of course, demand is down dramatically, so it's allowed the market to tank. 
we're in an artificial slump in terms of demand. So the U.S. certainly doesn't need the number of rigs, and it doesn't need the uh, 2,000 rigs that we had in 2012 and 2013. So wells drilling 50 to 70 percent faster, it comes down to it means 30 to 50 percent fewer of everything. And that is everything from directional drillers, MWD engineers, to directional drilling companies. I mean, frankly, I mean, heck, this is the International Association of Directional Drilling. <clears throat> it, I take zero pleasure in making that statement. But the fact of the matter is, we don't need uh, 80 plus directional companies today in today's environment. Now that hits home with a lot of, a lot of people. But frankly, we don't need them. We don't need as many motors. We don't need as many bits. We don't need as many MWD uh, tools. We don't need as many rotary steerable tools because we're in a super depressed market right now. And I think barring a major geopolitical crisis, I don't see it recovering anytime soon. A lot of the recovery is going to be driven by something we have absolutely no influence on, and it's how fast do the world economies recover from the pandemic. So the impact on the supply chain. Is everybody enjoying this? Isn't this a nice, cheery uh, <laughs> presentation? I noticed the number of our participants has dropped dramatically uh, on Zoom. <laughs> So here's, here's sort of the current uh, supply chain. Now there's variations to this, but roughly this is the case. Directional drilling company has personnel to do the well planning. There is some training that takes place, even if it's just how do you run our MWD tool. A lot of the uh, equipment is being provided by uh, third parties. Now that's not true across the board. There are many directional companies that do actually have their own things. Generally, uh, they're being supplied by third parties. So that goes in like that. Directional company does differentiate itself. It does have its own repair and maintenance. You gotta keep the stuff together. You gotta get it out to the rig. And then that goes to the operator. Usually the bit is chosen by the operator. Not always, but usually. And of course, there's the drilling contract. So what if we look at an alternative supply chain? What if the directional drilling company goes away? Directional personnel are with the operator, well planning with the operator. They can source the equipment directly from the third party. Logistics and transportation can be handled by the rig and the drilling contractor. They can tell people when stuff needs to be out there. So is that going to be, now this is actually happening in some cases today. I think everybody in here knows that there's a number of operators that are doing this exact model directly. It's not common, it's not widespread, but it does happen. So the workforce, you've got the field personnel, repair and maintenance, well planning the operational support from the office. But now with the advent of real-time operation centers and this possible new business model, it could be that you end up with directional field professional who is just, he is a support person in the rig. You have a pit crew, helps to get equipment on the location, gets it set up, maybe pick it up, get it into the hole. You can have emergency support. So if you're drilling a curve, okay, let's go ahead and get a directional driller on location just to drill the curve. It's a model that has follows. You have tool and equipment maintenance, failure analysis and prevention. So that's what takes place in the field. Then you have directional support personnel that would be largely in the office. But you see there's 
this is a, a shift in the way it's traditionally been done. And I mentioned this earlier in the, in the uh, forum, is that are we actually looking at wellbore placement specialists, not directional drillers? If you look at the proof that it is important to be in a particular part of the reservoir and to have the understanding that that's where we need to be, not in a directional driller in the traditional sense because the metrics are going to be different. So in order to achieve this, I think there has to be a transformational business model that's put in place. The objectives have to be aligned. You can't hear on the rig, the company man or one of the engineers say, to blank with the production, we're gonna drill a well. But it happens. You know, we thought, now how in the world could you say something like that? It happens. The metrics are not lined up. I would, I, uh, Bill was saying that it happens the majority of the time and I would not disagree. But that's what I'm saying. And this is where I think things are broken. If you look at the operators, like I said, the biggest hit that they have taken, there's been two of them. One of them's kind of gone away. The two of them is that they can't deliver the well construction costs that they're predicting consistently. There's too big a spread. That has gotten better. Not only are people drilling faster, but there's not as much variation from the best well to the worst well as there was even a year ago. So that part has certainly gotten better. So the delivery costs are better. Of course, you know, the, the uh, price uh, points have been pushed down. All the people in the service company in the room can attest to the fact that they ain't getting what they were even at the beginning of the year in terms of prices. But the biggest challenge still, and why unconventionals are not an attractive investment opportunity, is because of the spread in the production. And essentially what we're saying here today is that by applying some understanding, getting a better comprehensive understanding of the reservoir, that there is in fact a discrete sidewalk, a production sidewalk that you can drill on, that you can stay on, which we are physically capable of doing. If you can do that and you can narrow the spread in terms of your production results, and maybe even more importantly, be able to predict what those results can be, then we have taken a lot of the headache away from the CEOs of the operating companies that are in the unconventionals. Now, that sounded easy to say. I'm not saying it's quite as easy to do, but I'm also not convinced that it's impossible. I actually think the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome is structural, not uh, from an execution standpoint. The fact is, is that the industry, the domestic industry is so siloed that the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. It's true in the operating companies. It's true in the major service companies that have multiple disciplines. A small directional company, I mean, they're focused on one thing and one thing only. But that kind of bring, brings up, you know, another point. I was talking to Allison here with Drakewell, and I said, you know, what is most of the record keeping in the field centered around? And it's centered around billing. It's centered around the billing uh, for the job. That's where, the, I mean, you, you, you're going to keep the surveys, right? Because that's required. You have to submit surveys, right? But other than that, what information is a directional company actually providing to the operator? It's the justification for the bill. Okay, we did this. Hey, you damaged our equipment, so you got to pay for, you know, a motor or you broke the rotary steerable or they get really excited when you've lost a rotary steerable and they get to charge you for that, right? But if you think about it, 
a lot of the information that comes back from the directional company to the operator is financial. But there's a wealth of information that the directional companies have that never makes it back. Like how could you drill this better? Now, the danger is if you don't tie production to it, you do like Joe did and you put whiting out of business, single-handedly. Maybe a slight stretch of dramatic effect, but maybe not that far because they figured out where that fast drilling zone was. Well, where were the drillers going to stay? Does it produce? Ron showed in many cases it doesn't. I think you're fortunate when the best drilling zone is also the best producing zone. But I don't think the stars align that frequently that that is in fact the case. Ron said he likes breaking stuff. I think that includes MWD tools by the end of the time because of the right rock, right? Just to add to what you're saying, there's also a lot of money left on the table from both the service providers and the operators because neither have enough data to really paint the correct picture or the right picture. Right. Uh, to get either the concessions or their tools paid for or or defend uh, that. And it, and it should be production focused anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, there is the mechanical element to it. Yes, we can't not have the tools to drill the wells. But I think, unfortunately, our focus is flawed. Yeah. It's too solid about all the functions and equipment, you know, and then me coming separate from the motor company, separate from the motor company, separate from the bid. And Not to mention the fact you have Franken tools. And then it, it gives the operator a little bit more uh, opportunity to say, well, sorry, you can't pay for your motor. It proved to me it was really the MWD, whatever that may be. I didn't break that motor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they kind of shrug their shoulders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or if, if, if your motor can't keep up, we'll find one that will. Yeah. Until they go through 10 motor companies and then come right so back. That's right. Yes. Well, and we've heard different people. I mean, remember where we started with this with Shauna? I mean, she's coming at it from a production standpoint, right? I can't get my 300 foot ESPs into these wells. And at least operating expenses, the cost of having to repair and replace those expensive ESPs. That's right. That's right. So Joe got kinky with a well and uh, put a couple of six, seven degree dog legs just to where they wanted to uh, put the ESP. And suddenly they can't put the ESP down there or they're having to replace these quarter million dollar uh, pieces of equipment every three months because they've got the bearings are wearing because they're, they're in a bind. And so, so the fact that he drilled the fastest well means absolutely nothing to the production guys because they can't get the bloody thing to produce. So, we really have to put the pieces together now. And you've heard me say this many times that on our biggest conferences, especially people say are constantly stressing the fact of communication. So this is great. We need to talk more like this. And I think it's universally recognized, but I think with a few exceptions, there aren't too many people that are doing much about it. But it's got to come from the operator. They're the ones with the money, the paying bills, selecting the service providers. And, you know, none of the people involved uh, trust the other, feel that they're committed to each other. You know, they're, they're speed dating with all the different service providers. Right. And nobody's making a commitment, okay, 
we're going to learn this together and make it work. But you know, uh, all the service providers are afraid of one failure, and they're going to get you know right, worse. right. And move on to somebody you know right or up to number seven. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue, Bill. Thank you. But who takes the lead in this? You know, you talk about the operators. The operators I put up here, because we are talking about directional drilling, are ones that have some form of their own service. Actually, three different models, but they all have some form. So are they taking the lead? But I'll tell you what, you talk to these companies, you know, that are doing their own directional drilling, are they tying it back to production? They all have the same cover holes. Yeah. All the different functions, but they still operate as separate companies. Right. And they all have the same health insurance and, you know, you can wear the same cover holes, but they're different guys. Because the drilling guys, I don't give a blank about production. I'm going to go as fast as I can because that's how I'm incentivized. That, that's how I keep my job. Yeah. And you don't blame me. You're doing it. No, no, and it really isn't a blame thing, is it? Because the objectives aren't aligned properly. Exactly. The guy who sets the overall project, the Contro, the Chevron, the Exxon, they're all the ones who got tied together. They're the general contractor. Well, and the question is, is going to be where, and I'll address that here in a minute. But you are seeing a shift here now into the rig contractors. And rig contractors are consciously making a decision to move towards to where they have a greater degree of influence on the overall producibility of the well. And I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you start seeing some commercial uh, incentives being tied into that well delivery process. So that is an emerging thing. And if you look at the bigger rig operators, they are actively acquiring the uh, capabilities of doing that type of thing, right? What do you see that are the differences between those three operators? I'm sorry? What are the differences between the three operators listed in the directional service? It's really in how they are doing their own directional drilling internally. Um, Chevron, for example, has pulled everything into a remote center, and uh, but they are continuing to work with service providers, you know, to, to get the equipment in and so forth. So there's it's more of a logistical thing and decision process. Uh, Hess has a little bit different model. Uh, they have guys, some guys in the field uh, that are like, for example, drilling the curve. They'll drill the curve with people on the rig, okay? Uh, Concho has their own directional company, so to speak, internally, but they're not the only one. So they have three or four other service companies that are also providing service. Well, that explains Dominator. Yeah, maybe. No, so. it does, because they found the fastest drill in the state. Yeah. That's, that's been a whole permanent experience, is they want to find the fastest drill. And the story, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. There's nothing else to it. That's right. Sorry, so e even there, the objectives aren't aligned. So to answer your question, Don, there are slightly different business models within those operators. And there's other operators that have some aspect of their own directional uh, provider, but um, it, it is very. But this is the point. And remember, you know, Bill had said, well, who takes the lead on this? Well, is this something that IEDD can actually help? You know, we're sort of an independent third party, so to speak, that maybe we can help to facilitate some of these things. You look at the speakers that we had today and the message that they were delivering. You know, I really feel like they just need somebody to help kind of guide things and coordinate it and help, help get the objectives aligned. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I'll ask a question here. I'm going to wrap up here in a minute. Um, who actually is responsible for production? Think about the, if you're in the service industry, who is it that you interact with that is actually responsible for production? It's not the drilling engineer. It's not the company man. It's not the geosteer. It's not the geologist. 
it's actually not the completion engineer, although in our industry, we don't even know who those guys are, right? It's not the drilling manager. It's not the geologic manager. You have to actually get up into the C-suite before somebody is actually personally responsible for the financial performance, which means how much production are we getting for the dollars that we're spending? So my point is, is that the people who actually are being graded on this are several steps removed from the blocking and tackling and where the execution actually takes place. So unless the message comes down from that area and you're allowed to align things, then I think we're going to struggle to consistently deliver the results that we really want to. So there are things that make a well produce. Right rock, right place, right completion, right production methods, right? So what hinders production? Well, wrong rock, wrong place. And the fact is that if Joe didn't have the kind of background he did, the guy who's most responsible for putting the well into the right rock or the wrong rock actually doesn't even know that there is a right rock or wrong rock, other than a line that's been drawn on a map. And it's not a reflection on the directional drillers. I mean, heck, these guys are amazing what they do. But if they don't know what where the sidewalk is, how can you expect them to stay on it? So moving forward, you know, a goal without a plan is just a wish, right? I want to see that we can form a collaborative environment that communicates the real objectives of the well. I think what we did today is a good first step, but that's all it is, is a first step. If we can't get the, the various members of the community together to have this kind of frank discussion in a, in a live fire exercise, a real well, then it sounds good that we need to be able to deliver the results. We need to have improved wellbore placement. The wellbore placement specialist has the most influence on the production of the well. He is the tip of the spear. We have room for operational improvement. We gotta quit breaking stuff. You know, we can't keep pushing equipment past its operating conditions and expect it to hold up. Thing is though, if we can get into this area where we know we wanna stay on the sidewalk, well heck, you can build the BHA to stay on the sidewalk. It's a very different. You don't need a 183 vent housing in the lateral to be able to stay, you have a 1A3 because these things kick you out and you can't get your way back in. And but that has an impact on the borehole quality, it has an impact on the operational life of the equipment. So there is certainly room for improvement. Automation and simulation have room. And training and education is gonna be a big thing. Because there's, you know, you heard me tell Ben, Okay, we need, to, we need to get this presentation, we need to get it recorded, we need to make it available. Now, how many directional drillers actually understand some of this stuff? How many people drill in the Bach and actually know what those different paces look like? I asked him when, when he uh, put the presentation together, I said, I want pictures of the rock. You saw, you saw how much variation there was from the top of the, uh, it's the middle Bach just the top of the middle Bakken to the bottom of the middle Bakken, you have three or four different facies in there and those rocks are very different. They frack a lot differently, don't they? And, but see, we can tie all this stuff together. So never underestimate the power of a directional driller, right? I knew you'd like that one, Alice. Well, poor placement. We need performance metrics, all right? We need a way of measuring this stuff that's mean, mean, meaningful. Geologic and production. 
geometric. Okay, yeah, we do kind of need to follow a line somehow, right? Well bore quality. There are operators that are starting to pay a lot closer attention to this. It's primarily because of the mechanical impact that it has. Because if you don't have good well bore quality, you tend to break stuff. And if you break stuff, you're not drilling as fast as you could. Operational performance certainly has its place, days versus depth. Yeah, we don't want to spend 25 days on a well we could drill in 15. But we do have to make sure that it's in the right place. Equipment performance. Hey, the car still got to drive. The tires have to stay together. You know, we, we don't want to not have the tie rods break as we're going around the curve, right? It usually uh, gives you a bad day. But I do believe we have to have standards, personnel and competency assessment. Do people really know what we need to do? And then finally, the equipment. Because people don't do what you expect, but what you inspect. So we have to have aligned performance criteria that actually deliver the results that we're looking for at the end of the day, which is in fact production. So the idea is let's get drilling towards production. Because I think it's gonna, it's gonna be required in today's environment, like I said at the earlier part of this wrap up, it is ugly out there. You know, we can't sugarcoat it. I mean, we're at a quarter of the rigs that we were at the beginning of the year. And I'm not quite sure we've hit the bottom yet. And I know we haven't even begun to see the number of companies start falling. So it's gonna be smaller, but we need to make these changes to make the industry viable in the long 